In this very personal passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul shares with us who are born-again believers three great benefits or blessings that God has given every one of us. The first benefit is God's pardon for my sin. We have past tense been justified, and present tense we have peace with God. The second benefit that we've learned about is God's presence for my strength. I have direct access to God, which is strength for my present. But there's also strength for the future because I also have a future anticipation of glory. Look at the last part of verse 2. It says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, that's talking about the future. That's talking about one day when we die, it's going to get even better. My father used to go to jail from time to time, not as a prisoner, but as part of a jail ministry at the First Baptist Church in Independence, Kansas, where he was pastor. He said he liked preaching in jails because you have a captive audience. You know, they don't get up and walk out on you. He was preaching a salvation message about going to heaven this one time, and he noticed there was this guy sitting back in the corner with his arms crossed and a scowl on his face. And after he finished, the guy came up to the bars and We'll just call the guy Frank. And he said, Frank said, I want you to know I don't believe in all that pie in the sky and buy and buy junk. My dad said, well, what do you believe? Frank said, I believe in getting everything you can here and now. So my dad said, okay, you don't believe in pie in the sky by and by. You believe in the pie in the nasty now and now. And Frank said, that's right. My dad eyeballed him in there and said, well, doesn't look like you're getting much pie right now, buddy. You know, you can do that when you have those bars between you. You can say a lot of things. Frank said, well, you're right. My dad proceeded to tell him as kindly as he knew how, saying, listen, in the Christian life, you get the pie in the now and now, because Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly right now. And Jesus also said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. The beautiful thing about the Christian life is you get your pie and you get to eat it too. The most tragic experience of life is to go through life and miss the pie now. And to miss this pie in the sky by and by. Paul was so excited about it. He used a strong word in verse 2. That word rejoice. Trust me, this is not the typical word for rejoice. It's a word that means to shout for joy. Paul said, every time I think about heaven, I just shout for joy. It's like when your team scores a run or a goal or a basket or touchdown or wins a game. The one-two, breaking ball out toward left field, hugging the line, this one's got a chance to go, go! Big fly for Albert Pujols! Collins driving, almost lost the handle. Chalmers for the tie. Got it! For 10 seconds. Unbelievable. And Kelsey runs an RPO. He's going to keep it. Dives right into the middle of the Cowboy defense. Touchdown! Kansas City! It makes you want to shout. So you shout. The third benefit or blessing is God's very, very practical pattern for my suffering. Verses 1 and 2 are doctrinal, but verses 3, 4, and 5 are practical. Paul wrote it because he knew the Christians in Rome were suffering, just as there are Christians now who are suffering and going through tough times with all the mandates and guidelines that we have in our society today. Paul was trying to say, listen, God has a pattern that you need to understand as it relates to your suffering. When I was a kid, My mom used to make some of our clothes, and she'd take a piece of fabric and put it out on the table, and then she'd take like a dress pattern and put the pattern down on the fabric, and then she'd cut out along the dotted lines, and then she'd sew it together and have a beautiful garment. You know, that's a miracle to me. I want you to know that I could never do that. What God is saying is upon the fabric of human suffering, I have superimposed my biblical pattern. And if you're willing to understand what I'm trying to do, the result will be something beautiful if you just don't mess it up. 
there are a couple things about God's pattern that we need to talk about. First of all, I want you to notice the process you go through. Rejoice. It's the same word I used earlier. It means to shout for joy. Sad thing is, so many Christians today look miserable. And I'm just convinced that so many Christians look miserable because they are miserable. You know, in life, suffering is inevitable. But misery is optional. It really is. Suffering is something that you don't have to go looking for. It's, it's something that's going to come looking for you. And in spite of this, the Bible says rejoice in and through your suffering. That doesn't come natural to us. It, it's not in our nature. So let's notice this process. First of all is the word suffering itself. It all starts with suffering. This word is the word thlipsis in Greek which means the pressing of olives or grapes. It's an automatopoetic word, which means it sounds like the sound it describes. Listen to this. Can't you just hear grapes or olives being crushed? Flipses, flipses. It means that in your life and my life, there are a lot of things that would pressure us, put us under stress and difficulties. By the way, do you really want to know what's on the inside of you? Watch what comes out when you get pressured, when you get squeezed really tight. That's what's really in there on the inside. And the sad thing is there are a lot of us who are suffering and who have suffered, but how many of us are rejoicing in that suffering? John Steinbeck, one of the greatest American authors, wrote East of Eden. And in that book, he describes a woman. Here's a description of one of his characters. He describes a person who's basically a miserable person. This is what he wrote, describing one of his characters. She was a tight, hard little woman, humorless as a chicken, with a dour Presbyterian mind. You could substitute any other denomination there, Baptist, Methodist, Assemblies of God. You can substitute Catholic. We're just going to use Baptist. So with a dour Baptist mind and a code of morals, that pinned down and beat the brains out of nearly everything that was pleasant in life. You know somebody like that? They almost glory in their misery. They think the more miserable they look, the more spiritual they are. They develop a holy look that's about half dead and half mad. I'm so spiritual because I'm miserable. No, friend. The Bible says you're going to suffer, but just don't experience misery. Instead, Rejoice in what happens. Paul says, rejoice in your suffering. You say, how can I do that? Well, you have to understand the process. Thank you, Lord, for the tools that you're giving us to help us through these times. Because, Lord, we're suffering. We're suffering in ways we've never suffered before and never imagined before. And chances are, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But I pray, Lord, that on the inside, we can still rejoice. Because on the inside, there's a process going on. And you're the part of that process that's the most important. And I pray, Lord, that we would understand that. That that process, you're doing something inside us. You're making something inside of us. And I pray we'd learn more about that next week. In Jesus' name, amen. of the blind pure